It's only 30 years of Alliance supporting the leagues, and we're not done yet. Only the leagues, only the Alliance leagues. Hello and welcome to the throw-in in association with Allianz with me, Sinead Kassan, Will and Michael are off this week. Coming up on the show, we'll have former Dublin footballer Philly McMahon and Conor McKeown to talk football and later John Milan with, will be with us to talk curling. Now we're going to start with the football. Philly and Conor, you're welcome to the show. Philly, you're in your gym there at the moment. I am. Apologies for the, the music in the background. If you're into dance music, great. You, you love it, but... Uh... Apologies for the noise. Well, Philly, before we get to the league, I was very pleased to read in your Irish Independent column last Saturday that you've been invited to Mayo after all, after all these years. <laughs> I have, yeah. Um, boy, uh, uh, yeah, boy, an interesting... One of them is a, is a very interesting person that was connected to um, to one of the teams. So I, I think I might take that up, offer up when I get the time. Um <laughs> When fatherhood kind of gives me a bit more, bit more space and time, I'll definitely go down to Mayo to try help in any way I can in relation to the topics that I've been asked to go down and speak about. Good stuff. So your column before the Dublin Mayo game was well received in Mayo then, was it? Yeah, like, um, obviously, uh, there would have been people from Mayo maybe thinking I was prodding a little bit, but I was just giving me honest opinion what I felt. Um, I work with teams so I can get a sense of the environment um, from a different outlook, I suppose, uh, as, as a player also that have been in that kind of the heat of battle. So I just gave me honest opinion on what I felt and what I've seen over the years. Um, and understandably, people might have been uh, rubbed up the wrong way. But um, again, the reason I, I started to, to do a bit of work with the, with the independents was that I, I wanted to give me honest feedback and give the viewer a different aspect to, to what's being written by let's say the journalists that are out there right now and Connor you're the man who has to kind of do the prod to Philly what's he like to work with well as long as he doesn't bring me into his gym there I think we'll get on <laughs> brand <yeah. laughs> okay lads well look we're going to start with yesterday's game at Newbridge obviously Kildare 112 Dublin 12 points I mean what a win for Kildare their first win over Dublin since 2000 and what a loss for Dublin their fourth in a row in the league in a rele- relegation battle Philly can you believe what you're seeing with these results no, not 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 really. To be honest, um, I suppose I didn't realise. Uh, I I always look. look we've said in the media before, uh, even when things were going so well for us, that it would never it would never last forever. Um, and people thought we were, you know, just saying those things, but we we did mean them. Like you know, and uh, you look at you know most sports that have teams, uh, team environments. This is what happens, you know. Um, so. The problem is that we've kind of fell off the cliff quite, you know, off a big, big cliff. So we're, we're kind of in a bit of bother there, like, you know. And, um, yeah, I, do, I just think it was very interesting for me. Um, you know, the rest of the country I knew wanted the dubs to eventually to, to fall off that. that. But it, it's interesting that, you know, you just realised how much the dubs were hated. So um, that's that's a bit sad, but... Uh, that's the bias, the biasness of me being a dog, you know. What do you imagine it's like in the Dublin camp now, Philly? You'd know the likes of Brian Fenton, obviously, Kieran Kilkenny. Are they looking around going, what the hell's going on here? I feel for the lads, you know, because um, they're at the end of that. That's their, this is their time, you know, this is their time in their career. You don't, you can't press pause to an extent and come back and say, oh no, it's bad now, I'll leave and come back. And Or you can't say, you know, well, do you know what, I'll, I'll jump in in five or ten years' time. Like, this is their time now, and unfortunately, they're at the getting the tail end of a very successful team, uh, and they've been a part of su- the success as well. That success story. Uh, it must be extremely difficult because uh, we haven't went through this transition yet, so it's not something that we can kind of, you know, take from somewhere and, and um, learn from already. It's it's just it's it's something totally new to this group and new to this management. So it's going to be if look if. They come out of this, and you know, they win an All Ireland out of this. It's an unbelievable story, like it's an unbelievable achievement, and that's the, the opportunity that's within this. You know, Dublin, if they go on and let's say stay in Division One, win the next three games, and they go on to win an All Ireland, it's an incredible story. It's probably one of the biggest stories that I would have said would maybe overshadow some of the stuff that uh, the group I was with has achieved. 
Connor, Eamon Sweeney wrote in the Irish Independent this morning that the Dubs look like a team that's fed up with football and perhaps also fed up of its manager. What do you think of that? I think it's very, very harsh. And I think it's probably severe. And I don't think it's particularly accurate. Um, like fed up with football, like these guys are going training four days a week. You know, if you're fed up with football, you just don't commit to that. Um, and 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 the enjoyable part, I would imagine, is the match at the weekend. And if you're not enjoying that, which I can't imagine the Dublin players are at the moment, you know, the Tuesday mornings or the Thursday evenings or or the warm down sessions or the whatever else, that's going to be even less enjoyable. So. No, I wouldn't doubt the commitment to these players or how much they, you know, they want this season ahead. And, and I would imagine there's probably a few fellas in that dress room um, and part of that group, if not sort of enjoying what, what they're at at the moment. Certainly, there's a bit of novelty about the challenge that's there before. You know, it's it's fresh, it's different. Like, if you take the team that Philly was on there, like they rolled from season into season and nobody ever retired and the backroom team stayed largely and they just evolved ever so slightly. Um, and they beat everybody because they were good enough to beat everybody. And then they went into the championship and they did the same there. And, and this is a different thing. And I would just, I would think that for fellas like Fenton and Kilkenny and John Small and the fellas who are, are all of a sudden now the, you know, the, the, the load bearing elements of this Dublin team, you know, I think they'll enjoy it eventually. Um, but but that none of that is to take away the fact from, you know, Dublin should be better than they are at the moment. You know, the performances don't match up to the some of the talent that's on the team. Um, and the stuff about Desi, like I, I think some of that stuff is off the wall as well. You know, you have to remember Desi Farrell won a first won All Ireland in his first year. And that was the poison chalice, you know, it was the first year after Jim went. And I think he did a great job of holding it together and maybe winning an All-Ireland off the fumes of the five in a row. What happened last year, I think, was inevitable. Um, and, and, and it is striking how quickly the kind of the pillars are crumbling. But, you know, my own suspicion is that Dublin have a very defined plan for the season. Um, and the performances such as they are at the moment... Uh, are a bit of collateral damage there. Now, that's not to excuse them, you know. Like, you perform like that, you're going to lose in Division 1. You lose four weeks in a row in Division 1, you're into a relegation battle. You have to deal with all the sort of, you know, the publicity and the negative kind of noise around the team that comes with that. Um, well, I think when we look back at the season, I'm, I'm not sure that Dublin's year will be defined by their first four games in the league. Because, like, I don't know how many times we've seen this in the past in the National League where you know, the league tends to be divided into two sections anyway. Um, and there's a break now for a week. You know, Kerry lost their first four games in 2013 and they came back and nearly beat Dublin in one of the best games of all time in an All Ireland semi final. And, you know, Mayo were masters over the last 10 years of kind of finding form in the last couple of games to avoid relegation. So I suppose uh, what, to, to sum it up, if Dublin continued like this to the end of the league, I think they will be in serious bother. But um, I'm expecting an upturn in performance uh, at the very least over the last three games. What do you think, Philly? Do you think uh, criticism of Desi Farrell might be over the top? Oh, definitely. Yeah, like, um, it's again, and, and you know what? It's feeding into the fans a little bit. Um, so there's these articles that um, when you peel it all back, you can see the problem a little bit to maybe uh, store it or maybe to increase the noise. Um, and now the fans are kind of getting involved because that's, the, that's what they're listening to. So then they're starting to kind of, that's the conversation, you know. Um, at the end of the day, we should not be become very similar to the soccer world where when a team is struggling, that you headhunt the manager. Like, that's not GAA. It shouldn't be that way. Um, because Desi Farrell is volunteering to, to try help a team, to try help a county, his, his county, um, to be successful like nobody should be headhunted in that respect you know or should be told get out or whatever it may be he'll have a term you know whether it's three years or whether they give him an extension or um, he's there to basically try give this group of players the best uh, or the optimum environment they need to be successful outside of football and inside of football and and that's you can't question that you can't question that somebody's in there trying to give it our best. Um, now, the thing is, um, like, re re regardless of, of, of what the, you know, what Jorno was saying about kind of Desi or the narrative that's been spinned off, um, that it's essentially the management. This is, a, this is a very complex issue. Like, this is not just get one person out and everything will change. Um, 
as Connor mentioned, you could say it was a poison chalice for the success that came before him. But what comes after him is very important because, yes, this might become a kind of Alex Ferguson type narrative where you're kind of like, uh, well, you know, Alex Ferguson's success. And then after that, then you are, you know, looking for managers. And But that's not what GAA is about. Like, you know, it's a, it's a cultural thing. Um, you have the base of players that you have. You have to work. You have to give them the optimal environment. And then you see what comes out of that. So for me, um, it's lazy. It's lazy to just to say it's it's Desi, Desi Farrell's fault or any of the management's fault or the players' fault. It's complex. It's it's a collective shift of uh, mindset that's needed right now. I think there's there's there has to be a spin off of you know this is what you've been fed in terms of information from outside that's impacted on the pitch. So what I'm saying basically is in a nutshell. The players are performing what they are thinking, right? So you 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 essentially are what you think, and that's what that's what's happening. I would feel. So the opportunity of that is like, lads, wouldn't it be amazing if we went to win? win we, we we went on to win the All Ireland after all this adversity, right? And that would prove everybody wrong, and that's what you want to be doing. You want to be saying, what is the biggest challenge here? What is the biggest opportunity from that challenge? And let's get after it. Uh, that would excite me because this team, lo- a lot of these lads have won All-Ireland. So it shouldn't be, let's win an All-Ireland. It should be, what's greater than that? Well, we have a diversity here. So, you know, can we, in 2022, say that we lost the first four league games, everybody was out for us, everybody was talking about getting rid of the manager, all of this sort of stuff. And we went on and won an All-Ireland. I think that is, for me, if I was still in the camp now, I would be excited for that. And that that's the narrative that has to be spinned within the group. Um, maybe they need to take a little trip away together as a group just to get out of the, this environment because it, it is toxic and it, it, it does have a huge impact on the way you perform and think on the pitch. So do you believe Desi can turn this around? Do you believe they will stay up and that they'll avoid that relegation then, Philly? <sighs> It's a difficult task. Let, let me be honest. It's a difficult task because uh, the only the only way I think teams teams could maybe uh, lose the that little bit of motivation to beat the Dubs because it's four teams that have done it now, right? Because if you're the first team to beat the Dubs, um, like Armagh did, or or maybe you're saying Mayo is it's the second time Mayo bet them consecutively, you know, then there's a little bit of buzz around that. However. I would definitely think the Northern teams that they have left are thinking, we could relegate the Dubs here. Mm. That's really what we are trying to do. So um, so that's difficult. And then there's a challenge around that. And it's kind of like, look, if I was in the change room again and if I was the manager, I'd be saying, listen, we're well, one good performance away from getting back on the road. That's all it takes. Let's take it whatever, half by half or quarter by quarter and let's get a good performance. Let's really progress from what we've done the last game you know when, when you're underperforming that's what you need to narrow it down to because if you keep just thinking we need to win we need to win we need to win uh, you've probably lost the game before you've even played it because you're thinking of the outcome so going back to what Jim would have preached years for years and, and, and the media would have hated get back to the process get back to really pulling apart the performance pillars and what's needed for the group and essentially then just focus on what's ahead of you. Now the narrative is relegation. So that's now on top of underperforming or losing four out of four. So it's getting noisier and noisier and noisier. Um, and you just want players like Brian Fenton to get back into it. I thought Kieran was very good the weekend. There's a few players now starting to show a little bit more about them. I uh, thought Davy Bourne was, was very was good. Um you know, disappointing that they conceded the goal. If they could get a clean sheet against Kildare, that they little uh, they little things that would build uh, going into each game. So, um, yeah, I think now what's going to happen is they're going to go and play Northern teams. So they got they got to really have that bit of grit and that bit of physicality to to get over the line. Now, Connor, we have to mention Kildare here. Obviously, great scenes at the end of Newbridge with the Kildare players and the management and all the celebrating. Why not? Like you, you need days like this. And who cares if it's only February? Daniel Flynn, Jimmy Highland, so impressive yesterday. You think back to last September, Jack O'Connor leaving, Glenn Ryan taking over. What a job he and his team have been doing, Connor. 
I have, yeah. And like Kildare, are, like the history of Kildare the last 10 years, you know, has been that they they have these little kind of, um, they have these little patches where they'll only get to a point. And that point tends to be, you know, a Leinster final or an all quarter quarterfinal or division one of the league. Um, but it looks like they're kind of maybe primed to kind of go on to the next level. And an awful lot of that comes down to, you know, as Philly says, you are what you think, you know. And I think for a Kildare team that has been sort of subjugated and, and, and everything else by Dublin for so long, like if you go and beat Dublin, regardless of the circumstances of Dublin, you can change what you think about yourself. And I think that's a huge thing for Kildare because unfortunately, if you look around the landscape at the moment, uh, Leinster teams are not faring well in the league. You know, Mead would be the third team you would put into that bracket as, you know, potential Leinster finalists. And they face a battle to stay in the All-Ireland series this year if they don't make a provincial final because they could be relegated from Division 2. So for Kildare, there's enormous opportunity. And, and you know, I, I understand the way teams build and, and improve is focusing on themselves. But I think if you're Kildare, there's a, <laughs> there's a very obvious thing to look at outside your camp, and that's Dublin. And the reason is you're going to have to beat Dublin in a Leinster final to make that improvement because, you know, staying in Division 1 would be a huge thing now for Kildare, and they can go on and achieve it, particularly after getting over the line at the weekend because um, they probably should have gotten over the line against Toronto. They didn't quite do it. You know, we saw with our mag yesterday against Mayo as well. Finishing off those games against hardened Division 1 teams is a different discipline to matching them for 70 minutes. Like being a point ahead of the final whistle is a discipline in and of itself. So to stay open would be a big thing. But the next biggest thing for Kildare would be to win a Leinster title. You know, they could nearly draw a line under their whole season if they achieved that because it would have massive... Um, it would have massive uh, benefits for them. And I think beating Dublin in the league is definitely the best thing to do in preparation for that. Absolutely. Now, well, we will move on to Dr. Hyde Park and Mayo against Armagh. A two-point win for Mayo. You, you mentioned it there, Connor. A first defeat of the league for Armagh. Mayo came from behind to win. Was that just that bit of inexperience in the Armagh team that told in the end? Maybe, but I think, like, I was up in Clonus with Mayo beat um, Monaghan and I thought they looked really good that night as well. Um, or that afternoon there was nothing particularly new about Mayo you were kind of impressed with Mayo in the way that you expect to be impressed with Mayo you know they were all hard running from their half back line I think Ryan O'Donoghue who has gone to another level now um, as an inside forward it'll be really interesting to see what happens when Killian O'Connor comes back there because O'Donoghue is actually demanding a lot of the ball that kind of goes into that area particularly in the absence of Tommy Conroy and one player in the last couple of weeks I've been really impressed with is Dermot O'Connor about three or four years ago, I thought Daniel O'Connor was going to absolutely go to the top echelons of Gaelic footballers. And I know I know he's had injury issues and that sort of thing, but I've always felt that, you know, Daniel O'Connor should nearly be Mayo's Sean O'Shea or Dirk Kieran Kilkenny, where nearly every play goes through him because for a guy who's so kind of big and athletic, um, he also has a brilliant end product. And I think he showed that at the weekend. And But Mayo, I think, are, like Mayo and Kerry are the two teams that are looking at this league um, and they're kind of the exact opposite of Dublin. They know exactly what they're about. Um, they're trying out, you know, one or two players, but not a huge sort of battalion of them. And you have all their big players are performing in every game. Pora Cahora, to me, last year was the fine for Mayo because they've had so many inside backs that were good footballers, but never a guy who could, you know, just physically dominate that area and who kind of radiated confidence from full back, almost like a Rory O'Carroll. Um, so yeah, like like Mayo reeled them in, but that's because Mayo I think are so battle hardened. And regardless of the situation they were in, they never went forcing the goal. They never went pressing up too far to force turnovers high up the pitch and got caught. They just did it in the in in the the way you're supposed to do it by you know sticking to that process. And you know our map played brilliant for most of that game, and they got that boost at the very early goal. But it, like I think they probably learned a harsh enough lesson because like regardless of how good. Armagh have started this year in Division 1, you know, if, if you're that far ahead and you can see the last seven points of the match, I think you'll be sore enough during the week. Yeah, uh, Philly, we mentioned that uh, column you wrote a few weeks ago before the Dublin Mayo game and the notion of an identity vacuum. You think Mayo suffer from this and it's part of the reason you think that they fail to get over the line and win in All-Ireland. Now, we know it's only the league. So can the league change your mind on your view of that? Yes, definitely. Now, <clears throat> I think it's key to mention that um, I was kind of talking about kind of previous leaders um, or previous kind of people that were in the team. So um, it's starting to change. Like, you know, there's, you can see that, you know, Connor mentioned, Dame O'Connor has been a leader for them. Um, 
he he certainly for me I would agree with Connor has been somebody that has stepped up to that and um I I just think yes I think when you look at the league campaign right now you can see that they're really going for it like you know they're going like I mean previous years it would have been a lot different and it would kind of what you see right now was probably what we would have experienced through the season of, of the league campaign so we're um we're seeing a different kind of mindset from Mayo uh, this year where they're kind of going after it. And um, it'll be interesting then to see what happens in championship. Like, interestingly, on, on the Armagh thing is I, I'm kind of really looking forward to seeing um, does Armagh self-sabotage themselves by being happy with how well they've done so far in the league or do they actually kick on and say, do you know what, let's... <clears throat> Let's try win this league. If we can win this league, then we can compete with anybody in the championship. Um, and that can be fatiguing, and that can, you know, this, you know, as much as the season in in certain ways can be short, it can also be long in, in that respect. So, um, so I, I look, I think it's exciting. It's, it's a pity the Dubs are down the bottom, but <laughs> I think it's a really, really good league this this year so far. Um, it's been obviously we've you, you would have heard a lot that. The league has been so competitive over the years, and I think it's got even competitive this year. But I do think there's different Mayo, different kind of, I think a different outlook on Mayo this year in the league campaign. And I'm really interested to see how that transfers into the championship. Yeah, exactly. that's interesting, Philly, because, I mean, you look at the character of this Mayo team, lost in All-Ireland last year that many would have tipped them to win against Tyrone, and they've responded by, you know, going unbeaten so far in this league. Yeah, yeah. So that 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 shows you their intent straight away, you know, um, that they want to get back up and, and, and get going again. So look at if their intent was to like build on performances and blood new players and uh get ready for championship, which was kind of you could say was previous kind of the intention of, of the Mayo group. Um now it's kind of like let's try win. Let's try like, you know, we've been dominant in Connacht, but let's try win the league. Let's try then get after you know that positivity of a mindset going into the into the championship campaign. Um, now that the Dubs might be in kind of the rear view a little bit, um, considering they've bet the Dublin team twice in a row, uh, I do think then their focus might shift a little bit differently to what what, what it was after they bet Dublin in, in the All Ireland semi final last year. Hmm. Okay, let, well, let's move on, lads, to what happened in Inniskeen yesterday. Kerry, still unbeaten in the league. They beat Monaghan uh, 3-14 to 1-12. I suppose a talking point in this game was Rory Began. We, we saw the risk of what could happen when a goalkeeper is caught out of position. And we know what Rory Began can do. And it seems like, I, I think Kerry really went after that yesterday and punished him when he was caught out of position with those goals from Shawnee O'Shea and David Clifford. Philly, what do you make of the keeper playing outfield at times? I don't know. I, I get very nervous. To be honest. Yes. <laughs> I get some. Sometimes I get nervous with full backs on the ball. Never mind the goalkeepers, <laughs> like you know. Um, so the the question is, do you get the re- the reward from the risk? That's and, it. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'd say if you if you're you know a, a statistician, you would say that very few teams would probably score. Um, when a keeper's turned over, or maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't. A, pl- a player coming out, it's about a numerical advantage. Can you get an extra man coming out of defence if there's a high press, let's say, uh, or it's a kick out? Can you decrease the space of the opposition? So uh, after that, then you've seen obviously Noel Morgan and and, and Began kind of getting up and getting the one or two scores um, from open play. Like so, but I'm not too sure you're going to get the return that you're looking for. I don't know why you would need the goalkeeper coming out unless you've got a really high press team. May are very good at it, so you need to know you need to have a, a very calm keeper. Um but again, it's something that I think it's it's new. Will it catch on? Will the rest of the teams do it? I'd say keepers might do it on, on the back of them doing it. But if it was me, I'd be saying, what's the point? Unless you're just trying to create an overlap. Yeah, it definitely gives me the heebie jeebies seeing a goalkeeper come out like that. What do you think, Connor? Well, I just wonder about begging a small bit. Um, you know, was it just an off day from yesterday? Well, no, like it, 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 I don't think it's an off day because he got caught. Okay, the one that just narrowly went over his mm. head, and um, you could just say that he got his angles wrong or he he wasn't quite sure his position in, um, in front of the goal. But the same thing in Clonus against Mayo two weeks um, previous to that, or three weeks previous to that, 
Um, like I understand in certain situations why a goalkeeper will come up, you know, to press the opposition's kick out, you know, you're condensing the space, means the keeper has less to aim at. And certainly when other teams play with a low block, with a lot of players behind the ball, and you need one extra body to, to make a run, you know, like a player that they're not expecting. But where it backfires is situations like this. And what Mayo did very well in that game a couple of weeks back is when Monaghan were trying to work the ball out of their full back line, the press that Mayo had, one of the players stood beside Began and marked him. And Monaghan's full back line are so used to knowing that Began is their out ball that they look to him every time. And then they saw that one of the Mayo forwards was standing beside him. And they, ne- they nearly panicked and nearly turned out over the ball six yards out from goal with nobody in the net. So, um, like, I understand the benefits to it. And obviously, because Began is such a good kicker of the ball, he's a good dis- distributor if you get him in good situations. But I don't see the I don't see the, the wisdom in mindlessly going up to join every single attack. I think you kind of pick and choose your moments. Because if teams know you're going to come up every time, they're going to prepare for you. And I think part of the you know the effectiveness of goalkeepers during the attack is the element of surprise you're not expecting mm. it and then it happens um but if, if it's in a situation now that you're preparing to play Monaghan I think that's one of the things that you look out and I think Kerry definitely did before that game yesterday yeah just uh, Philly a quick word on Kerry I mean they're probably traveling as well as Jack O'Connor would hope for in this league what's impressed you about them so far yeah I think I think Kerry are in the driving seat um right now I think they're they're, uh, they're probably the best performing at the minute. Uh, I do think that um, they they set out to their stall quite strong uh, with Jack O'Connor. Like I mean, uh, in respect to the teams he started with, there wasn't this progressive type ball with bleed players in, and it was kind of like let's go for it, you know. Uh, and every look, we all know then when you have a new a new manager coming in, all all you know, obviously he's this is a second stint, but I do think. Um, uh, yeah, I would feel that Kerry, like the Dubs and, and like Mayo now this year, would always get their foundations right with having a good league campaign and then building on into the championship, which is key. So, look, the key thing for me is when you have two, probably three key forwards that are dangerous, it's very hard to counteract that. And Kerry have that in abundance. Um, if you're watching David Clifford, then you have to watch Paddy Clifford, and then Geeny comes in, and then Sean O'Shea. So um, it's quite difficult to set up to beat that unless you go with that low block, as Connor said, the hybrid defence, or you know, getting the, getting the, the players behind the ball to decrease their space so that you're nullifying them. Um, the always the question is is the is the opposite end, you know? Um, and I think well, the least conceded so far in the league. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. So, so that's why I think they've set out a strong stall because they've they've been tight at the back, and um, we've seen a different. I think I think that's what they've probably went after as a group this year. Can we actually be you know um, ruthless in, in terms of who we play against and make sure that defensively we are solid? Mm-hmm. And once you get those both of those two things right, you're 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 on the you're on the road to to something right. And just finally, Philly, before we let you go back to, to your gym there and to work, obviously, Donegal uh, beat Tyrone 210 to 12 points. Dublin up next now for Tyrone in Oma. I mean, this is going to be the battles of all battles, isn't it? Yeah, well, this is where Tyrone can put the boot in. Um, and, I, and I do think this is like if <clears throat> it's very hard for a team, you know, when they there's a gap of winning in all Ireland to to replicate the, the, the intensity levels the following year. Um, but I think Tyrone have started to kind of get going a little bit. You know, they they, they had a slow start of the league, so yeah, it's set up for a nice one. Um, there's a week break in between, which 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 will do the Dubs really really well. Uh, might do Tyrone really good as well because of of the Donegal game. So it's going to be set up for a nice one. I think um, the last time I was up in Alma, uh, you know, it, it was physical. It was it was variables. I had it all. I uh, loved playing Tyrone, loved playing at home, and would love to be playing that game because of, uh, you know, as you I might said, need you, Philly. No, no, my time is done. Um, so, but uh, yeah, yeah, I would love, I'd love to uh, be involved with that. So, again, look at it's, it's this week is very important to both of those groups. The preparation will be uh, key, and whoever wins that game, you, you can basically peel that back to their preparation this week. Great stuff, Philly. Thanks for joining us.
So next we look back on the hurling action. Connor is staying with us and John Milan is here. Let's start in Division 1, Group A. So Cork beat Limerick at the Gaelic Grounds 219 to 113, a nine-point win. John, you asked the question in your Irish Independent column on Saturday about this game. Do Cork go all out and try and pick up a result or do they hold back hoping their performance will come in the first round of the championship when they host Limerick in Pork e Kiev? So what did we get? Oh, they went all out and by God did they the day set set the tone there for what's to come there in 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 April. And I thought they were magnificent uh, yesterday. And I was I sat at home watching the match, and it was the first time I said, you know what? It was the first time I really thought to myself, Cork, you know, back when O'Halpine and Gardner, uh, the Rock, that that team that we came up came up against. It was the first time I said to myself, Cork, this Cork team really mean business, and Cork like. They've been knocking on the door the last couple of years. They got to the All-Ireland final last year. But if you're a Cork supporter waking up this, this morning, you'd be some way excited of what you've seen yesterday. And I thought they were, I thought they were, they were magnificent. I really did. And they, as, as I touched on in the article as well, they're starting to find a few players. I thought Kieran Joyce was, was, was brilliant. He's a top, top player. He's going to be a, he's a big find for Cork. And I said, could they honour another couple of, Players, they found a player in 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 Dara Dara uh, O'Leary at the back at the back. Uh, Dara Dara O'Leary at the back. I thought he was he was he was very good. Uh, Barrett, you know. Then they're bringing an, a load of lads off off the bench, and it was very it was very interesting how they went about. You know, curtailing Keen Lynch yesterday. You know, they played they played Melrick on him in the first half. He was peeling off of the he he was peeling off. As he does from number eleven, and then Miller was 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 picking him up, which allowed Coleman to sit in the pocket in front of the D. But Melrick didn't go and mark him in the in, in the second half. Uh, Darrell O'Leary came out and marked him in the second half, which I thought was very very interesting. And what what that told me is that you know Clark didn't want to give too much away. I'd say Melrick will be Plan A, and I'd say Darrow O'Leary will be, will be Plan B. And I thought they were ravenous. I thought they just really were really really went for Jess. They brought a load of energy to it. And yeah, I just thought I thought they I thought they were excellent. And it's it's one fixture to really look forward to uh, on Easter Sunday is, is going to be that that uh, fixture of Limerick and, and Cork down and then a Park and Grieve. Ravenous really went for Connor. You were at the Gaelic grounds. Uh what impressed you in particular? Well, what impressed me in particular was you know, I think when we think about Cork playing well, um, we associate them with with pace um, and running in behind. And the problem with trying to do it against Limerick is that our half-back line won't come out far enough that you can actually run in behind them. You're running to brick walls. And they never went for that yesterday. An awful lot of their scores came from further out the pitch. The goals, you know, one of them came from a, a long ball that Patrick Horgan caught over Dan Morrissey. And, and again, this is one of these things that people talk about now, but it's a huge aspect of the game. I think I saw a statistic during the week in the build-up to the match that Limerick's or Cork's tackle count in last year's All Ireland final was something like forty-one or forty-two. I'd say they had that surpassed by half time yesterday in the Gaelic grounds. We were looking at the, some of the Cork players coming off the pitch afterwards, and they're big, big men. And um, there's an awful lot of strength there as well, aligned to the skill that they have and the obvious pace that they have as well. So. I think if anything was learned from last year's All Ireland final, it was just that they're going to have to have more to them than just pace if they're going to want to be Glimmerick. And it was far more to them yesterday. They were, you know, like they, they fronted up and the game became fractious when the two settings off came. They didn't take a backward step um, all across their half back line. And when their midfielders dropped deep, they forced Limerick to take, you know, like, like Limerick are so good at those short, sharp stick passes to hand. But yesterday they were getting hit and stopped and then trying to, you know, flick a one-handed pass up into the air. And it's just, you know, it slows Limerick down and they never really kind of got into their stride. And even in the second half, when John Kiley brought on um, Dermot Bournes and Aaron Galan and Willow Donahue, it made no material difference. You know, Cork had the game home and hose. And when it was over, there was no big celebrations either. They just kind of got off the pitch and got on with it. So, yeah, like there was, there was an awful lot to be pressed by it. The only caveat I would say is that Limerick were so far off it yesterday, you would just suspect that the kind of training they're doing isn't conducive to them producing a performance uh, at the moment. You know, the fact that they've lost three games in a row. Um, and like if they were slightly off it yesterday, you'd say, OK, Limerick are finding it hard to get back to that same level. 
but they're so far shy of it. You know, you just <laughs> your suspicion is maybe that there's that there's something uh, that nobody really wants to kind of tell you about that's going on to their play because there wasn't really kind of an outstanding lim- limit performance. Like Galan was definitely an improvement on Reedy when he came on. Just because I was Keen Lynch. Yeah, Keen Lynch. Like Melrick, as, as John says, like in the first half, Melrick just did not give him a sniff. Did not give him a sniff. And in the second half, I think he maybe dropped a little bit deeper to try and get on the ball, but. Like even with his touch and his vision and his his imagination, there were so many bodies in that area. He just found it hard to find any space. So um, the other thing, and I know John mentioned it there again, but it's worth repeating that, that Karen Joyce, like he went on Tom Morris yesterday and he did absolutely incredible for a young fella. Like that's a, that's a big big task, um, because you know Morris is a, a very physical player and he's a very good hurler as well. So you know, um, I think there was nothing but positives to take from the day from Cork. Plus, 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 we touched on a Saturday, the form of Dara Fitzgibbon. You know, Dara Fitzgibbon seems to be back to the form of 2018, 2019. He was brilliant. I mean, he was just up and down the field, looking for work, you know, getting on and mounting the ball. I think he's key for Cork. And the form of him, Kieran Kingston will be delighted with his form. And he, he rightly so picked up, picked up the man of the match yesterday. So I think, you know, if, if he can cont- continue that form, uh, you know, Cork or Gold places. John, is there any panic here? I mean, we were just talking to Phil Philly there about, you know, Dublin and their run of defeats in, in the football league. You know, that's three defeats now for Limerick. Um, John Kiley said after the game that, the, you know, the players are hurting, but there is not much panic there. Are we to kind of, you know, trusting Limerick that they're just probably on a different trajectory at the moment through this league? Well, well, Sinead, the way I look at it, right, Limerick have played two home games in front of two big crowds. They're all Ireland champions. Now, don't tell me for one minute that they went set out in, in set out their stall to lose the Galway and to lose the Cork in the manner in which they in which in which they done. Now one thing we're finding out is that their panel depth is not as strong as we all thought it was. Okay. So I think what they do have, as as we've touched on the last couple of weeks, they possibly do have the best 14, 15 players. And 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 to be fair to them, they haven't had their full contingent out just yet. Now, John Kiley touched on it after the, after the match that he trusts these players, that they will come right. Uh, you know, they're playing clear next weekend down in Ennis, and I think they'll be eager to, to win that match. They should beat awfully. And then they've, they've three or four weeks out from, from the championship. But look, I, I think Limerick can take some of the last year that they were able to switch it on after coming off a, a, a bad league campaign. But something's going to be different this year with Sinead, with, with, with the league, right? We're starting off in April the 17th, and all the talk out there, oh, it's going to be different come championship and conditions are going to be different. I've played in, in, in April fixtures, club fixtures, league fixtures in April. And let me tell you, the climate, the, 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 climate, the weather is going to be something similar to the way it is now. I often play in April where it's, it's windy out, it's mm-hmm. raining, the ground is, is, is not top of the top of the ground. So, there is, there is the likelihood that the first two or three rounds of the Munster Championship are going to be in similar conditions to, to what we've seen yesterday. So, should John Kiley be worried? No. But I think he'll be eager to win Sunday and to win, to win the last game against Offaly and to set him up for, uh, for an, an enthralling game down, down on Parky Creeve. And the first two games, they play Cork. If they were to lose to Cork, then they would for coming to town, coming to Limerick and would for in a rich vein of farm. All of a sudden, then, if you know, I'm not saying they're going to lose the first two games, but if if, if they were, if, if something mad did happen and they were, the unexpected was to happen that they lost their first two games, well, then you, you, you know, you, it's roll up your sleeves time and you're, you're fighting for your life in the Munster Championship, then, you know. Yeah, of course, look, hindsight is an easy thing, but Connor, will we only know the significance of this game, you know, after they play in that Munster Championship game in whatever it is, seven weeks' time? Yeah, like there's two, like there's two ways of looking at that. As John said, you know, this, the conditions are going to be very, very similar. And, you know, the start of the Munster Championship is so close um, to the end of the league this year. Um, and you go straight into it that the idea that you're going to flick a switch, you know, from the end of the league to the very start and all of a sudden your form comes together. It's a little bit kind of fanciful. But by the same token, it would make sense that, you know, you know, if you take it as red that a team can't go at 95% for an entire season, this would be the point of the year when you're just started to build towards it you know I don't think Limerick are sort of impervious to, to poor form you know even a team as good as Limerick are going to have to turn it on at some stage 
Um, and like with Offaly in their last game, particularly at home, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're definitely going to win that game. So they're going to want to perform an Ennis um, in a serious way. And the other big thing yesterday was that a lot of the younger players who we thought might put more pressure on the very established guys, you know, they didn't really do it. Um, and I, I would imagine that when when John Kiley sits down to select his team uh, for that game against Cork, it's going to look very, very familiar, which is good in one way because the majority of those fellas won three of the last four All Irelands. But by the same token, you know, you, you know, sooner or later you're going to start springing leaks and fellas will lose form and somebody's going to get injured. So you know, I, I, like you can't. I don't think they could necessarily write off yesterday as just kind of collateral damage in in, in the bigger picture of Limerick season. Um, but by the same token. They're going to need to start turning up the notch pretty quickly because, as John said, the start of the month's championship, it's not a very forgiven um, place, even for a team of Limerick's calibre this year. And, like, and like where, where, where do Limerick win the majority of the matches? Is in that middle third. Those eight players of Will O'Donnell, uh, Hannon, uh, Burns, Will O'Donnell, Donovan, uh, uh, Keane Lynch, Hegarty, and Morrissey. Those eight haven't played together as, 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 as a set eight. So, you know, when those eight come together, you know, they're still going to be formidable opposition to, to, to beat. But if they were to lose one out of any of those eight players, well, then question marks could arise. You know, you even take someone like, oh, I think the key fella, I'll be, everyone is saying Keane Lynch, I think the key, key champ for, for Limerick is Will O'Donnell in the middle of the field. You know, he, he came off against Galway. He didn't start yesterday. And, you know, you've seen it when he came on yesterday. He started to throw himself about, started to, you know, be the bully that he, that he is. Now, I say a bully, I say bully in giving him a, a compliment uh, because he's that type of player. But, you know, I think it's the key thing for Kylie is, is those eight players. If he can get, get those eight players back onto the field, uh, they're still going to be very difficult to beat. And just on the right cars, Connor, as well, actually. Yeah, and just one last point on Limerick as well. I, I mean, you know, you can only have a certain level of dominance before teams actually start to focus on you in their own preparation. And I think that was kind of, you could see it in the way that Cork lined out. Like, you know, Jack O'Connor was kept on the bench. Like, he was a fella who, who looked like his pace could kind of kill anybody. And I think Cork now are better built specifically to beat Limerick off the back of that thing. So, you know, I would imagine that all the, all the top managers in the country of the teams who want to win Munster, who want to win the All-Ireland, have one eye on Limerick now as well. And that makes their level of difficulty in every match um, that little bit higher because teams know if they don't get eight strong, aggressive bodies around the middle to contest every single breakdown, every single rook ball, they're going to get killed because no team generates scoring chances to, at, at the level that Limerick do in the same way that Limerick do. So, you know, all their strong points are going to come in under huge scrutiny and under huge pressure this year. So, um, you know, that's another factor for Limerick this year that, that you know, the, the methods that they've had over the last few years when they've dominated, um, you know, teams are going to go after them there because there's no choice. And those red cards, Connor, Shane Kingston and Seamus Brown. Oh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I thought they were straight red straight away. Yeah, um, yeah. You, could, you could see in real time, um, the first one was definitely a straight red for Kingston. And I think because of the level of similarity uh, just in, in the one that Flanagan had and literally the, the TV replays hadn't finished showing the first one before the second one happened. And yeah. because it was just before halftime and it was just threatening to boil over, I think uh, it was inevitable that Sean Stack set him off. Okay. Does, 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 one, does a one fan, you know, fit the crime yesterday of, of some some of the... You know, I'm not. I'm not saying for one minute Shane Kingston is a dirty player. He's not. He's. It's just not. It's not in, in his makeup to do it. But I think you know, possibly a two match ban. Should you think it should be two? I, I do. I do. Now look, who am I to say I've I've, I've dished out a few tackles uh, over the years and I've, I've been on the receiving end of it an awful lot of punishment. But you know, a tackle like that actually, it's it's that's a jaw breaker. You know, you could break your jaw. You could concussion now. You could be out for two or three months so I don't think one match fits the crime there I think two matches for me you know Okay well uh, Limerick will go to Ennis to face Clare next weekend and uh, it's Cork against Galway now it was a great win for Wexford and Pierce Stadium Galway 15 points Wexford 2-15 a 6 point win John that's three wins from three in the league now for Wexford Dar Egan really has this Wexford team humming along very nicely doesn't he uh, what, what, what's impressed you about Wexford? Yeah, and we've got to kind of take him a bit of, you know, we've kind of got to take him a bit of serious. They've kind of gone in under a bit of the radar since Davy left, you know, and 
you know, you take it if if that was three wins on the tr- on, on, on the trot under Davy. I mean, everyone would be thinking, everyone would hear about us. Everyone would hear about it, and, and I think, I think you know, it's probably suits Wexford at the moment mm-hmm. that you know they're kind of under the radar that you know you, you know what you're going to get when when Davy's over a team that you know there's going to be that media focus on them. You know, you look at Galway, all the folks on them with, with Henry, and I just think it kind of suits. Wexford at the moment. They understated, yeah. Someone like Dar Egan is coming in mm. and, you know, nothing is highly expected of him. And, you know, he's just surrounding himself with some some excellent, excellent men. And I suppose everyone was judging him off of that Welsh, Welsh Cup defeat to, to Dublin. But how they responded, I mean, beating Limerick in the manner in which they in which they, they beat Limerick. And then they go up to Ennis and go up to Salt Hill, two difficult venues. And they pick up two Brilliant away wins. Massive kudos to him. And, and to do it with the personnel that they're missing. I mean, yesterday they were missing probably one of the top full-backs in the, in the country, Liam Ryan. Uh, you know, probably their best player, Lee Chin. And their, their, their go-to guy in, in the full four in, in Conor McDonald. But what they have, they have the X-Factor up front. They have the X-Factor in, 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 in Rory O'Connor. And he's shown it the last, the last few games. But, you know... Massive kudos to, to Dar Egan and his management team. And look, they're starting to sprinkle a couple of young lads in there as well, starting to give an awful lot of lads uh, their opportunities. And they're starting to build a bit of a, a panel there for themselves. And, you know, I think they're one team that we're going to have to keep an eye on. And let's not forget, look, they were Leinster champions three years ago. A lot of these lads are coming into their prime. Last year, they were very unlucky. Uh, the two games, they were very unlucky against Kilkenny. Could have beaten Kilkenny, got to the Leinster final, could have won the Leinster championship. Uh, and they push Clare up and up in Torres. So, yeah, they're one team to keep an eye on. And they're in a league semi-final now. Out of the teams are left, Limerick are gone, Cork, Wexford, you know, possibly Waterford, Dublin. Those four teams, I think those four teams should really go after the league. And I think a league a league, a league, league success for, for Wexford would be, would be a massive injection for them going into the championship. Connor, what part of uh, Galway's game let them down then against Wexford? They weren't really at the same um their speed of hurling, you know. I think think a lot of the the the, the movement of the Wexford, you know, half back line when they get forward and the half forward that they pull the Galway defence out of position. Like it's 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 interesting that Henry has gone with so many of the kind of tried and trusted Galway defenders and you know, Corrick Mannion and Dahi Burke and Gro McInerney and Adrian Tuvi as well. I, I like I thought maybe some of those would sit out maybe a few of these league games. So um, he's obviously trying to establish the Galway defence uh, in whatever shape he wants them to kind of set up. But like other than um, uh, other than Connor Cooney, sorry, up front, the Galway forwards didn't show a whole pile either. Now, like Evan Nyland was brilliant in the previous game, and he only came on as a sub. So like there's, there's, there's very clearly a rotation thing going on here. Henry is trialing out a lot of players, particularly from midfield up. Um, but in terms of their in terms of their movement and in, in terms of their ability to track. Uh, Wexford's runners and, and close down the space from the areas that Wexford were shooting from they were a little bit off the pace yesterday Okay lads we're going to finish on uh, the Tipperary Dublin game and uh, that finished Dublin 216 Tipperary 21 points Dublin also maintained their unbeaten record a really good start to the league John here as well um, I know it's early days as well but Matty Kenny said after that it's about kind of getting that consistency of performance for them and they really are getting that consistency yeah, I was at that match, covered that match uh, Saturday, and you know I think they would have been it would have been unjust if they didn't come out of Torres with, with, with the with the two points, and Tipperary could have could have stolen it in the end, but for about fifty fifty five minutes, uh, they were very very good in the first half. I mean, only for their their their, their shooting was a bit a bit off 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 scratch. They could have been well ahead at, at a half time, but you know they're going they're going along nicely. Uh, you know they've they've. Nice back line, nice full back, or probably one of the best full backs in the country. Uh, they're solid at the back and up front. Then you know they probably won the best midfield parents in, in the country in, in Connor Burke and uh, Chris Cromie. And then across the half four line, then you know you've Suckliff, Ryan McBride, and uh, Burke. It's a top top half four line. And then they have the, have a killer in in Ronan Hayes inside. And you know Trollier Dillon is, is still to come into the side. So. Yeah, again, they play Kilkenny the weekend. If they beat Kilkenny, probably minus the, the Ballyhale contingent, that puts them into a, into, into a league semi-final. 
And there's no reason why they can't, when they see the teams that are left in the, probably going to be left in the competition after the weekend, there's probably no reason why they can't target a, a, a league, league success. I thought they, were, thought they were very, very good. And, you know, great credit to them. They're going along nicely. And they're going to have a big say in the Dentro Championship, uh, I, I feel, this year. Yeah, Conor, will, will other teams, you know, the likes of Dublin feel that, you know, this, is, this league is there for them? Yeah, they will. I think Dublin are one of those teams that needed to go well in the league because, um, you know, more or less we probably know, say, 13 or 14 of the Dublin team. Matty Kenny knows what he has. They haven't brought through too many players in the league. Um, and for the last couple of years, Dublin have maybe not struggled, but, you know, you could tell that the way Matty sets them up is, is in a very methodical way, moving the ball, how they defend, how Conor Burke drops back. I think Paddy Smith played that number six role very well at the weekend that Liam Rush has played in the past. Um, but I think, you know, given how strong their team is comparative to their championship or their likely championship team, Dublin are going to have to pick up wins here. Um, and uh, they have been doing that. Like John mentioned, Owen O'Donnell, I'm not sure people really, uh, people appreciate just how good O'Donnell is. Um, and I think Danny Sutcliffe over the last two years, you know, he's gotten back to the form of 2013. He's sort of very brash, but he, he imposes himself on games and his distribution is really good. Um, but for Dublin, like winning a league would be huge because mm. none, like other than Danny Sutcliffe, none of these players, I think, have any silverware. Um, and the other thing is, you know, in previous years with the round robin, Dublin started with Kilkenny in the first round and then they'd play Wexford the, pre- the, the following week after Wexford would have a bye week. So Wexford would be coming in fresh. So they had to hit the ground running in Leinster, whereas this year, I think they've got Westmead and Leash in two of their first three games. So I think going to a league final... Um, the benefits for for Dublin would far outweigh any you know potential dangers or anything like that. So yeah, like if Dublin beat Kilkenny next Saturday in Parnell Park, I think there's a fair chance that they're gonna they're gonna go that far. And um, you know, I think it's just what the doctor ordered for this team and the development because they've been kind of making slow progress over the last couple of years. But the next thing is to go and win something now. And like if the league title is definitely there for for the taking, they should go and, and win it because you saw what a big thing it did for Anthony Daly's team in 2011. You know, they were, they were in all Ireland semi-final later that year. They, were, they won Leinster in 2013. So, you know, it would be a huge thing for Dublin. Okay, great stuff, uh, Connor and John. Thanks for joining us. So that's it from us on this week's The Throw-In in association with Alliance. You can listen and follow the show on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcast from. Thanks for listening. It's only 30 years of Alliance supporting the leagues and we're not done yet. Only the leagues, only the Alliance leagues.